On the line with me now is uh, a guest that I've been uh, hoping to get on the show for quite some time and a guy that I've been following on Twitter for quite a while and more recently found out about an organization that he's a part of and he is actually the founder and operator or director of called You Are the Power. It's a membership-based nonprofit and their uh, their essentially their goal is to um, spread, act on, uh, spread and act on the principle of human respect. His name is Spike Cohen. Spike, welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you on. Hey, I'm happy to be on, Brad. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. So let's talk, first of all, about your organization. You originally started out as a young man doing, uh, like, website design or software development or something like that, and, and then developed into political activism and all of that, and now here you are with this organization called You Are the Power. Tell us a little bit about the story leading up to where we are today. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make my, my 20 plus year story as brief as possible. <laughs> so, uh, sure. So I started my first company uh, when I was 16. That was a web design company uh, that branched off into other startup development things that I was involved in. Uh, in uh, 2014, uh, or I, was, uh, I started developing what uh, was later diagnosed as multiple sclerosis. Uh, as a result of that, I decided to retire from uh, what I was doing and, and kind of get more involved in what something that felt more purposeful than, than mm. just making money. Uh, I'd reached a point where I could do that uh, without having to worry about the finances behind it. And um, and so that led into me getting involved in, in uh, Liberty podcasting and stuff like that. That led to my being the Libertarian Party's uh, vice presidential candidate in the 2020 uh, election. And that led to me realizing that there were a lot of people who wanted to spread freedom and help those in need, but didn't know how to do it except every four years. Um, and there were a lot of other people who needed our help. And so that led to me in uh, 2022 la officially launching You Are the Power. And that's exactly what we do. We find people who are being abused and disrespected by their local governments, and we organize uh, their local communities and our network of thousands of activists across the country to get them the respect and the justice they deserve. Now, there's several stories that, that I've seen that you've talked about, whether it's through social media or, or your website or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. some of them are, I mean, just truly, truly heart wrenching the way the 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 government has just, I mean, I don't know how to describe it other than victimize these people. Yeah, yeah. No, it has been horrific. The, the most recent ones that we're working on right now um, are a series of stories that we are uncovering, and there are many more to come, unfortunately, where the Georgia Department of Family and Children's Services, or DFACS, um, has basically been running what I can only call a child trafficking operation. Mm. They are taking children who they know have not been abused and who have chronic health conditions, and because they want the federal dollars that come with seizing children with chronic health conditions who they can ac accuse the parents of being abused, they do exactly that. They have no evidence. They actually have every bit of evidence that there is no abuse, and, in, and they choose to seize these children uh, put pending criminal charges on the parents that they often never follow through on because they have no evidence. Uh, but because they put those pending criminal charges on, that's enough for the family court judges to take to permanently take the children from the parents, order non reunification, put the child up for adopt children up for adoption, and destroy these families when they've done absolutely nothing wrong. And they do it entirely because of the state and federal money they get to do it. They've been doing this for years. They've been getting away with it. We've now found out about it, and we were going to put a stop to it. Now, clearly, you're putting a lot of eyes on this, and and I've seen so many of the people people that have reached out to you through, again, through social media and your website. And I've actually become a member of You Are the Power myself. And, and awesome, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm just going, how does this even happen? How do we get to this point? Uh, two things. Uh, number one, they can. Mm. So we have a situation where the government has basically created uh, the authority for themselves to do whatever they want. Thanks to policies like qualified immunity, they can't be sued even when it's established that they've broken the law. So so the individual enforcers and, and uh, agents know that there's really nothing they can do that they can really get in trouble, uh, especially if they're higher ups for telling them to do it. And the ones, and we're now having uh, former defects workers coming forward saying that they were told that if they did not find kids uh, to uh, to put in po foster care, they were fired. 
and even if the kids weren't being abused. Ugh. And um, so basically they can and no one and, and they believe no one can stop them. Um, and then the other reason is because there is a massive profit motive. Thanks to the way Title Four D of the Social Security Act is written, uh, anytime the a state agency um, it, uh, finds a case of abuse, uh, it, they get a certain amount of money. If uh, that abused child has any kind of health condition, they get even more money. If that child ends up having to be placed for adoption, both they and the adoptive parent get even more money. Uh, and so there is every financial incentive in place for them to call as many children as possible um, abuse victims. And so I will tell, and this is no amount of hyperbole, if you are a parent in Georgia and you have children with a health condition that leads them to have um, fractures in their bones, something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, and you take your children to a children's hospital, there is a very good chance that you will very soon never see your children again. The accused and that is abuse. how bad it is. Mm. You will be accused of abuse. And because of the stigma of being accused of that, a lot of parents have just taken it on the chin. They don't come forward because they think that most people are going to assume that they did it. Oh and so gosh. what we're thankfully a handful of very brave parents have. Uh, it started with the Hernandez family. Matt and Tucky Hernandez reached out to us first. And then when we went public with their story, we now have uh, families coming out of the woodwork. And each story seems to be more horrifying than the last one. It is absolutely horrific what they are doing. Now, of course, you guys are working on this and, and this is you're talking specifically about Georgia. But it seems I remember one of the stories referenced a, a doctor from Alaska or, or Wisconsin or something like that. Is that related to all of this or is that a separate story? Uh uh, well, so that is one of the Georgia stories. So okay. there is a doctor named Dr. Barbara Knox, and she was the head of child abuse physicians, in, child abuse pediatrics uh, in the, I believe it's called the Alaska Cares Health System, and also one in Wisconsin. She was doing both of those. In both cases, uh, those both of those organizations investigated her and determined that she was faking cases of abuse and falsely accusing parents and pressuring her colleagues to join her in in saying that these kids were being abused um and so she resigned in disgrace and was hired by wilson's children's hospital in jacksonville florida which is where unfortunately one of these parents these georgia parents oh. had to take their children to and the georgia defects took the word of a woman who has a years-long history of false allegations of abuse and who have at, has had to actually resign uh in disgrace for that um, one of the policies we believe needs to change is that false accusations of child abuse need to be considered malpractice, and that would put it, that would help put an end mm. to this on the child abuse pediatrics level. So, uh, when we start talking about this, you know, of course, this is Georgia specifically, but you also mentioned Title IV of the Social Security Act. Is yep. this something that needs to be handled at a at a at a federal level as well? And are, are you having any of those conversations with with uh, congressmen, senators, and so on? Uh, we believe that there needs to be a change. Right now, we are focusing at the state level to try to get reforms that can be done there. But yes, we believe that the, the head of this monster is the, the federal monopoly, monopoly money that's being thrown all over the place, uh, including in this thing. We, we think there needs to be a federal defunding of these state services. They need to come up with their own budgets and stop getting you know billions or hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funding, which is incentivizing them to come up with abuse cases. Yeah. Um, there, there are two other cases we've dealt with uh, in uh, Dallas, Texas, which were exactly the same type of thing. Uh, one where uh, a family had their child at home, a home birth with a, a midwife and their, their pediatrician didn't like that. And so he called the police on them. Uh, they, their newborn daughter was taken from them for the better part of uh, two or three months before us and many other organizations helped get their child back to them. Uh, we are now also dealing with a mother named Jocelyn Sanders. Uh, she didn't like the uh, meds that uh, that were prescribed to her son. Uh, she was he was prescribed clindamycin, which is a very potentially dangerous drug, mm -hmm. and uh, it comes with a black box warning. And so she got a second opinion. They put him on a, a milder antibiotic that was working. The next day, her child was stolen from her, and she hasn't had him since. And he almost died under their care. So you mentioned the black box warning. We've only got about a, a minute and a half here before we got to take a yeah. quick break. What, is, what exactly is a black box warning on a, on a drug? It's the highest level of warning for a legally prescribed drug. Um, and uh, clindamycin is uh, supposed to be reserved for very severe infections. Uh, she was correct 
in not having it prescribed to him because he almost died when they see when they seized him from the, from her and started putting him on clindamycin. And he needed a pick line and a feeding tube and, and many other things. They still have him under under uh, their under their custody even after the uh, um, PD, uh, the doctors in her hearing said that he would have done better under her care. They still have him. <sighs> this is what we're dealing with. And well, if people want to help us fight against this stuff, go to youarethepower.net and you can help us join uh, join us in this fight to get these. Uh, families reunited and, and put this nightmare behind them. And and that was kind of what I was going to ask next. If you can stick with me through the break here, I'd love to talk a little bit more about how people can get involved and what they can do to help you and, and your organization fight this fight against the, the the absolute radical government overreach, because that's really what it is, isn't it? Yes, that's 100 percent what it is. It is it is politicians who think they can do whatever they want to us and are being incentivized with our money to do it. Yeah. Your organization, you are the power. How do people help? I mean, I read some of these stories that there was one was it Corey and Diana who who just were ordered non reunification yeah. and, and some other yep. things. Uh, I mean, how do people help? I've become a member uh, of the organization because that's kind of how it's based. But how do people do that? Yeah, so the first thing that you can do is go to youarethepower.net and sign up to become a member today. Um, that is the first step that you can take to join our network of thousands of uh, liberty activists across the, the country that are fighting for people and families uh, like the Sullivans and the Timses and the Hernandezes and the Sanders and, and many others. Um, and so that's the first thing you can do. The next thing that you can do is we actually have set up cause pages for each one of our causes. Mm. Um, and you can go to those and they have all of the information about each family um, and about the officials that you can contact. Um, and we even give you a template for wording that you can use when you contact them to explain what it is we want them to do. Um, and so uh, for the Sullivan family, it's youwarethepower.net slash Sullivan. Uh, for the Tims family, it is youarethepower.net slash Tims, T-I-M-M-S. Uh, and then for the Hernandez family, it's uh, youarethepower.net slash Hernandez. Um, and many people that are hearing this might think, you know, what, what is my email going to do? What, you know, what is me contacting these people going to do? In the Hernandez case, the family court judge who was initially refusing to hear evidence that uh, their child, uh, that their child, Emma, uh, had a medical condition, did, but after she received thousands of emails from people, uh, uh, thanks to you or the power, uh, she made a complete 180 inexplicably and decided that she was going to allow the children to live with family. And as soon as the charges are dropped, that she would drop everything on her end as well. So you have way more power than you think in contacting these people. They are not used to hearing uh, hundreds or thousands of angry people telling them to do the right thing. Well, and that was kind of the, the, the direction it was, was, kind of wanting to go as we continue the conversation the the name you are the power we really do have a little bit more uh influence and more power than than we yes. we realize don't we oh a hundred percent so part of the problem is that uh or part of the reason why politicians uh it often seems like they're being adversarial intentionally it's because they are they know that if they can give you the impression that they have all this power and there's nothing you can do about it, that they'll just kind of beat you into submission. Yeah, you might show up to vote every two years or every four years, but you're not really going to get involved because you feel like there's nothing that you can do about it. And I'm helping to we are helping to cure that at You Are the Power by showing that, no, if we agree on this, that this is wrong and we reach out to these people and let them know it is not going to be politically expedient for them to continue on the path they're going and that they need to start doing the right thing. We get results uh, starting from when we first uh, organized uh, You Are the Power, we have had between an 80 and 90 percent success rate on the causes that we have taken on. Sometimes it's overnight or within a few days. Sometimes it takes months, but we almost always win. And in every case, even in the ones where the government doesn't back off, that uh, the public of that local community is far more the wiser of what's going on in their backyard, and they're far more engaged after that. So I say we win every single time. 
you have so much more power than you thought that you did. So let me let me kind of change gears a, a little bit here because this comes then down to some of your other work and your involvement with the Libertarian Party. And and I guess my my sole reason for having you on or my, my initial reason for having you on was to talk about you are the power and all that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. I, I don't think we can talk about Spike Cohen without talking about your activism within the, the Libertarian Party. And I've been kind of okay. making that journey myself self more from conservatism towards libertarianism in fact my friend michael white says that i i should be uh, i should be writing a book called conservatarian the the, mm. the the journey from conservatism to liberal or to libertarianism so talk a little bit about how the you are the power and your your kind of political uh leanings influence what you do at you are the power Sure. So uh, I will say this. Um, I am very happy to talk about Libertarian Party politics and the Libertarian Party and all of that. You Were the Power is a nonpartisan nonprofit. We right. work with Libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, everything else. Um, I, I, I guess where I could say they might relate in a way is that what I am trying to do with You Were the Power, instead of having political arguments with people about what they should call themselves, whether they should consider themselves a conservative or a liberal or progressive or a socialist or a libertarian or anything else, I'm trying to drive it down into something we all intrinsically agree with. And that's what I call the principle of human respect. Mm. Whether you like someone or respect someone or even care or know about someone, we are able to interact with each other on a day-to-day basis with relatively little to no fear that anything bad is going to happen to us because we all intrinsically understand that we owe one another a certain level of respect that we are individual human beings. It's why we don't step on each other the way that we would step on a bug. It's why we don't, um, you know, that we, we don't treat a human being the way that we would an animal. And any time that someone steps outside of that respect and disrespects other people, we see the harm that comes from it. So this is something everyone agrees with, and we expect it of one another unless it's the government. And then we put that expectation aside that we be respected as individual human beings. And so what we're doing at You Are the Power, yes, right now we are helping people who, you know, that come to us with these terrible situations that are happening to them at the hands of their government. And we organize the community to fight against it and to get them justice and, they, and to get the government to back off and, and end these nightmares for these people and for these families. What we're also doing is we are showing that this is what happens when we allow people not to respect us as individual human beings. And that it is its core is what drives everything that I do. You can call it libertarianism. You can call it constitutionalism. You can call it whatever you want. But at the bottom line, it is about demanding the same level of respect for individual human beings that we would expect of anyone else, because government officials are simply human beings who have been given a specific job that does not exempt them from the the basic level of respect that we expect. So you've got a phrase that I, I absolutely love. You talk about regularly on, on social media and, and everywhere I've seen you really, you talk about this phrase, bully the government or cyber bully the government. Cyber bully the government, yeah. <laughs> talk, talk a little <laughs> bit about that real quick and, and tell us what that means. So people don't think that you're, you know, trying to organize the next civil war. No, 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 nothing like that. In fact, I believe that this is what stops that from having to happen. Um, the when I say cyberbully, it's obviously very tongue in cheek. Yeah. Um, what I'm saying is that these government officials um, very often operate. Uh, I say in silence, but it's really out in the open, but with no one paying attention. You know, these city councils get together and do some of the most horrific things that you could imagine any of the human beings living in your community could do to to another human being. And yet, because, you know, it's kind of a boring thing going to a city council meeting or whatever, they get away with it. No one knows it. And so these people expect that they can just, you know, run roughshod over people blatantly and out in the open and no one will even know or care. And then we show up. And hundreds or thousands of people are emailing them and, you know, uh, uh, commenting on their posts on social media and sending them private messages and on, on their socials and, uh, you know, uh, calling their their office phone number and leaving voicemails. And suddenly they feel the heat of the fact that the public is watching them and knows what they're doing and where before it was politically expedient to just do whatever they wanted. Now it's politically expedient to listen to us and start mm-hmm. respecting us. And if that doesn't work, we show up to their next meeting. By the dozens or hundreds, and now they know that we're not just internet people. Now we're actually in person 
telling them, we know what you're doing, cut it out. You're not a, you're not a bot. And, you know, and one of the things too, yeah, that I would, bot, yeah. that, that I would add to that is I've seen multiple videos of you at, at these various city council meetings and things across yeah. the country. And one of the things I love about the way you approach this is that you really do act with respect. You know, you're, you're, we, you know, kind of joke about cyber bullying the government, but you really are very respectful and very professional about the way you do it. And you also encourage the people that are part of you are the power to be similarly respectful. So you're, you know, practicing what you preach as they say. Yes, for two reasons. Number one, that's how I operate. I, I don't show up and say, oh, you so-and-so, you're a real jerk and you better. That's just not how I am. But there's another reason as well. Government officials would love nothing more than to play the victim. Mm. So what I, I tell people whenever I make these videos or these these posts about these different causes and I tell people go to, you know, to this page and reach out to these officials, I say, I want you to remember something because I'm as angry as you are. These people would love nothing more than to say, oh, no, why are all these people contacting me and saying mean things to me? I'm just doing my job. They would love nothing more to make it about themselves. But it's not about them, and it's not what we think about them. It is about this family or this person or this small business or whoever it is that we're trying to help get the justice and respect they deserve. So please be respectful. Yeah. And so when I show up to these meetings, I don't call them names and a bunch of other things. I tell them, I say, I don't think that you are sociopaths. I don't think that you think you're running some mafia style criminal organization. I think you think that you're doing your job. But the reality is, if this is what your job is, then you should quit because you're doing terrible things. Yeah. I think instead, you should look at these people as individual human beings, treat them with the respect that they deserve, and do the right thing here, and you know what the right thing is. And more often than not, it works. On the line with me is uh, Spike Cohen. He is the founder and director of You Are the Power, and he has been a libertarian political activist for quite some time, and a, a well-known um, I guess defender of the faith, if you will, as it relates to <laughs> liberty. And uh, uh, Spike, thanks for for joining the show. I appreciate you being here. It's truly an honor to have you on the show. Um, you've got a debate coming up. You're going to be debating with David Hogue, probably one of the more um, now uh, since the Stoneman Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, one of the more popular members of that crowd. Tell us a little bit about the debate, when and where and how we can see it and all that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be April 10th uh, at Dartmouth University. Um, and uh, very soon they're going to be scheduling the live stream video. Uh, so if you can't be there in person, uh, you'll be able to, um, to follow that video so that when it goes live on April 10th, you'll be able to watch it live. If you are in or around uh, the Dartmouth area in the New, ha New Hampshire slash Vermont area, um, uh, you can register as well. Both of these uh, are and will be available if you go to spikecohen.com slash gun debate. Uh, you'll get all the information there. Uh, and um, yeah, it's basically going to be um, one of the biggest or most well-known names in the pro-gun control world and uh, and me, who has been has traveled the country and seen firsthand the horrific harm that is caused by the government's war on guns, which frankly is just a war on people being able to defend themselves. Uh, it, it leads to uh, uh, horrific outcomes, including school shootings and mass shootings and these so-called no gun zones, which are really just fish in a barrel zones. And uh, I cannot wait to. Uh, dismantle and take apart every <laughs> pro-gun control argument, uh, hopefully in existence. I mean, I, I hope he brings them all because I, I can't wait to um, to um, uh, lovingly and carefully uh, uh, rip them into tiny shreds and explain <laughs> how, how wrong it is. One of the things that, that, that I've, I've said is, is, I mean, with all of the controversy over the last couple of days about the term bloodbath, I've, I've seen David Hogue speak and I've witnessed you speak and now, of course, done an interview with you for almost 45 minutes. And I feel like this is going to be a bloodbath. I mean, how do you, <laughs> in all seriousness, how do you go about doing that because i get as a radio host i get so infuriated by some of the nonsense that these people bring up and i just want to end up I, I end up just shouting and yelling at them and calling them a moron how do you <laughs> how do you avoid that well i mean you've just given away the game that's what i planned to do i thought that was the best <laughs> the best way forward right no no i anyone who has witnessed my debates uh who has watched any of the debates i've done before knows 
Uh, I don't come in with the idea of I'm going to go for the jugular, I'm going to destroy this person. I actually first try to look for, if possible, um, look for what do we agree on? Like, what are the, the, you know, this is not Sauron in front of me. We clearly, this is a person who believes that they're an, an agent for good and who wants good things. And we probably agree on the outcomes that we want, broadly speaking. So how do we get there? And so, yes, I will be absolutely dismantling any pro-gun control argument that he presents and explaining what the truth is and what the reality is. But at the same time, my goal at the end of the day is to make it clear that, A, I'm glad he showed up for a debate like this. Uh, B, yes, we agree that violence is bad and murder is bad and certainly innocent people being harmed is a bad thing. And C, here is what we know uh, using the old find, felt, uh, feel, felt, found uh, uh, model of, uh, of of sales. Here is what we have found works best to protect people, mm. and it's not what you came here to defend. And that's that's what my plan is. I I've seen people saying, you know, bloodbath or this is going to be worse than this is going to be like Tyson versus Paul if, <laughs> if it was in 1988 or something like that. Um, you know, I, I've seen all of those, but uh, that's really I'm not coming in to try to destroy this poor man. I I, I believe. Uh, even though I highly disagree with him on this subject, I think he he genuinely believes what he's doing is good. OK, mm. good. That's a great place to start. Let's go from there. So about uh, 60 seconds or so. Tell us real quick, one more time, kind of run down. If people want to be a part of you are the power, how do they do that? How do they get a hold of you or or become a member and, and all of that kind of give us the kind of the, the 60 second. I'm Spike Cohen and I approve this message. Yes. So if you would like to help me and many others across the country fight for people and families who are being ripped apart by their local governments and get them the justice they deserve and end the nightmares that they are facing for good, then go to youwerethepower.net and join us today. I I cannot wait to have you uh, to be a part of that. Um, if you are looking to just get my general spicy hot takes on the Internet, uh, <laughs> I am at Real Spike Cohen on X or Twitter or whatever. Uh, I am Spike Cohen on Facebook. I'm, I'm Spike Cohen everywhere. If you everywhere, look at Spike yeah. Cohen, it's not, it's not hard to find me. I'm, I'm a pretty, uh, pretty loud guy. If you ever get lost, just go to uh, the ATF's uh, account on that social media and you'll probably find me there <laughs> beating them up. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, and I, and Spike Cohen.com is, uh, that has my, uh, schedule of in-person events and things like that as well. But, uh, yeah, you were the power.net. If you want to be a part of, uh, of actually fighting back and getting results and winning for Liberty and helping people now join us at you were the power.net. And, and thanks again for having me on, man. I, I, I can't wait to be on again, hopefully in the future.